Okay, I've got just about 101, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to Syllabus Curb Appeal. My name is Kyle Foster and I am a staff member in Academic and Student Affairs here at the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education. Uh, before we kick it off with the actual webinar, just a couple of housekeeping items uh, from me. So, first of all, <clears throat> um, if you're not using your computer audio to listen, that's going to give you the best experience. So, I would definitely recommend that uh, if it's between using your phone to call in or your computer, your computer speakers are going to give you the, the best quality experience. You'll type all of your questions today in the Q&A box. So all of our, uh, our attendees today are muted. Um, we'll use the Q&A box to answer questions and I'll help uh, Tracy and Steve keep an eye on that throughout the presentation to make sure that we get all of your questions answered. This session is being recorded and it will be posted uh, afterwards on the uh, Learning X, uh, the Learning Innovation Summit website, onlineexcellence.onenet.net. So please feel free to share that out with anyone who you feel could benefit from this. And uh, if you need to watch it again yourself later on, you have the option of doing that. All of the, the videos from the last two weeks will be there. And um, as well as we're uh, streaming in our Facebook group. So if you're watching on Facebook, uh, we'll keep an eye out there for questions that you may uh, have in the comments section. The only other thing that I wanted to uh, note is the winner are the winners of our Oklahoma Online Learning Excellence Awards. This is part of our uh, annual summit. We recognize these folks for the great work that they're doing within the online space in Oklahoma higher education. So if you know any of these folks, be sure and give them a big congratulations. Our teaching award winner this year is Professor Don M. Pierce from the University of Central Oklahoma. The innovation award this year goes to the Institute for Learning Environment and Design, also there at UCO. And Marcy Grant of Southwestern Oklahoma State University is our individual leadership award winner. So kudos to those folks. They were, uh, their nominations were submitted by colleagues and they were uh, reviewed by a panel uh, of their peers from the Council for Online Learning Excellence, and they're doing some fantastic things here in uh, the online learning sphere in Oklahoma. So uh, well done to them. So with that, we are going to go ahead and uh, get started today. Your presenters, I am uh, pleased to introduce, we have Tracy Fairless. Tracy is Director of Learning Environment Design in the Center for E-Learning and Connected Environments at the University of Central Oklahoma. And our other presenter is Steve Cavello. Steve is a Rich Media Specialist at Granite State College. So uh, with that, Tracy and Steve, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Of course. Let me see if I can get... Now we did practice this earlier, but I'm obviously not pulling up the right screen yet, so bear with me here. Zoom's always a fun challenge. Yeah. Okay, you should be seeing it now. Does that look correct? It is, yes. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, and it switched on me again, so let me change my camera angle just a little bit. We'll get all the details worked out here in just a moment, so. All right, that kind of changes the lighting, but I think we'll, we'll make it just fine. Okay, so today we want to talk about um, the importance of the course syllabus and how we can use the information that we have in a syllabus to, um, to invigorate our students, to get them engaged earlier, um, to inform them in a better way. And so that's kind of the focus on today. So I'd start off by um, asking you to just think about, um, have you personally thought of ways to encourage your students um, to read the syllabus? And, and I mean to carefully read it. Um, you know, when we think about it, if we're in the face-to-face -face classroom, we typically walk into the classroom, we hand them the syllabus, display it on the big screen, or even perhaps, please don't tell me if you do this, but sometimes we even read it to them. And in the online classroom, it's a little more difficult to do that. We de really depend on the students to open that file attachment and spend some time going through it um, and, and really looking at that information. There's no doubt that the syllabi uh, information is important. Um, it sets the tone for the course. Everything about the course is in it. Um, 
but if you're like me, how many times have you have you had numerous questions, the same questions from students over and over again, and you just finally get to the point where you say, oh my gosh, did you read the syllabus? Um, all the answers to your questions are in the syllabus. And the fact is, they're just not reading it. Um, I recently did a poll uh, in the fall of two of my online courses that I teach. And out of 48 students, only 23 uh, admitted that they had actually read the syllabus. And of those 23, only 12 indicated that they had read it or reviewed it, uh, referenced it for that matter, more than once. Um, seven um, uh, had actually printed a hard copy and used that as a reference on a frequent basis. So, you know, when we're looking at that, we're seeing less than half of the students that are actually um, receiving that information. Um, it's really no wonder um, why students have questions and not, not only um, do they have questions, but often they don't even know what they should be asking. They're not even aware of, of enough about the course to know that they should be asking questions. So um, I found myself frustrated with this and um, I, I would guess that uh, as you're teaching online, you probably encounter uh, many of these same frustrations. I see we do have a, a question about okay. students using the syllabus. Okay. Uh, someone asked, do you use a syllabus quiz in your online courses? Okay, um, I do. I do use a syllabus quiz. Um, but again, I, you know, I think when we think about those questions, unless we're, we're really um, getting some specific questions that are, the answers kind of, are kind of buried in the syllabus, um, most of the time they can guess their way through that and, um, or they go to and find the answer and, and, and move on. So um, I'm not saying don't do that. Um, I think that that's one more way, one more technique to get them um, connected with the material and the information. Um, but I don't think we can lean on it maybe as much as we have in the past. And when I say we, I'm definitely referring to including myself um, in that. So that was a good question. So, you know, when we think about what, you know, the purpose of the syllabus is, I mean, it, it really functions as that contract uh, between um, the professor and the students. Um, and it's really critical that they understand the terms of that contract, if we can use that term kind of loosely. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, we, we just can't assume that, um, that they understand. Um, uh, I was recently speaking with a, another professor that was having problems with students that um, were really questioning some of the, the grading criteria for the course and, and the assignment descriptions. And, you know, and so I, I met with her and we sat down and, and looked. Um, her syllabus was 26 pages long. And, you know, from a student's perspective, even if they've picked it up and read it once, um, the likelihood that they're going to extract the, the really critical information from that um, is very marginal at best. And so, um, you know, I, I'm, from, from that, that's kind of where my idea for this presentation um, began is um, I, I think there's still a critical importance to have that printable, full, complete contract-like document in a course, um, but we want to move beyond that. And how do we extract some key elements or uh, key information from it and perhaps present it in a different way that maybe um, has a little bit more appeal uh, to students. So I've, I've been an educator for 26 years now and I love what I do. Um, I, I've taught in the classroom uh, for many years and I've taught online uh, in that environment for many years. And I think they both have advantages and disadvantages and um, enjoy both opportunities. But when I step back and think about it, if, if I were to have that next career, um, I think real estate would probably be my next choice. And it's often when I'm looking for an analogy or something to compare to, 
it's my natural go-to. So if you'll kind of follow along with me on this, um, um, I, I use the, the image that you're seeing here as really a, a, a reflection for curb appeal. And, you know, if I were to drive by this house, um, um, I might see great potential in it. I might be, you know, very interested and, and see beyond the overgrown bushes and the, the um, dirty look to it. And, and it actually looks very small. Um, but the important thing to think about here is that to the average home shopper um, driving by this, they would probably would continue to drive on by and not pay too much attention to it. Um, so think about, you know, what catches your attention. And if we, we kind of flip that over to the online classroom, um, presentation's important, style's important, simplicity's important. Um, they all, all of those have value. And, and I think we can carry that over to the online classroom very easily. Um, students identify with their experience in an online class with their first impression within a few clicks of the course. Um, we either have them and we have them engaged or we've probably already lost their interest. And so, you know, think about that uh, as you're designing your online classes and, and think about what your preference uh, would be. So to kind of get at what we're going to cover about more specifically, um, we're gonna look at some essential, or we just talked about the essential information, um, the core information that should be included in a syllabus. Um, we're gonna spend the majority of our time looking at um, 10 methods that you can use to enhance uh, your syllabus information. We'll spend a little bit of time looking at optional tools and also uh, talking about the importance of accessibility. So, um, so let's get started here with just some of the essential um, syllabus information. Um, and, you know, again, I make the assumption this is not new information um, to anyone. Uh, that might be an audience for this presentation, um, but I'm adding it in just as a, as a reference point. Um, at UCO, we actually use a UCO e-learning quality design principles rubric um, to evaluate all of our online classes. And the first section of that is what we refer to as our core information. And you'll notice um, over on the far right-hand column of this image, there are plus and minuses. Um, in order for a class to pass, all information that's found within the core has to receive a plus. So in other words, all items have to be present. Um, the remainder of the, uh, the rubric addresses uh, a variety of different areas such as learning environment design, assessment feedback, engagement, and innovation. And those have to achieve a 90% or above. But that core information um, really hits on some essential information that our online learners have to know. Um, that information like uh, your contact information, um, information about you, your, your background, your educational background, your likes, your dislikes, how to, how to contact you, um, more information about the, the description of the course, the objectives, um, descriptions about the assignments and assessments. Um, you can go through and read all of those. And I'm sure, again, uh, it's not new information to you, but just something that we want to, to keep in mind. Um, so as I said, we're gonna move on now and we're gonna look at um, how we take some of these core essential functions and present them in a different way that, that really uh, grabs the attention uh, of our students. So the, the essential functions um, that are listed here, uh, there are so many uh, creative ways to showcase these. And, and honestly, there's far more than what we have time for today. Um, I picked a few that, that I could pull some examples from. They're primarily um, examples that use video, um, some, uh, some uh, minor animation, and uh, a few with some interactions. Um, there's no doubt that video um, is a, a dominant part of our students' um, lives. 
And I was reading uh, just the other day that over 82% of the traffic uh, online now is uh, video related. Um, so it's, a, it's an essential part of our learner's world. And, and I think we have to, to begin um, using it and capitalizing on it. Um, when you think about it, just about anything we want to know these days, um, we Google it and then we YouTube it. And uh, those two, uh, two resources come to our rescue in, in many ways and our students uh, really are relying on video um, to help them learn. So the, the first area, um, the first element that I'd like to talk about is um, student readiness. And you might wonder why I've included a student readiness quiz in with a list of syllabus functions. Um, well, it, it's about early engagement. It, it's about putting the student at the center of his or her learning experience. Um, a readiness quiz can address a wide variety of online learning skills. Um, and I would venture to say that the specific questions and really even the students' answers are far less important than the students' act of interacting uh, and having contact with content immediately upon entering the course. Um, with a readiness quiz, they can receive some form of feedback um, that will help the student really um, perceive and understand what's important and which skills that they might need um, you know, to be successful in your class. Um, so at uh, UCO, we used Articulate Storyboard to create an Are You Ready um, online learning assessment. I won't go into great detail on this, but um, the main takeaway from this is that, is that the assessment is quick, it's very simple, and it provides visual feedback that's easy to interpret. Um, what you're not seeing in the images on the screen um, today is that the student actually receives um, some pretty specific feedback if they hover over the bar on, on each of those. Each bar represents a question. And so, you know, they, they can receive um, some very helpful uh, feedback to prepare them uh, for their online learning experience. So at that point, um, you know, we have them engaged. Um, and the next step is really um, <clears throat> kind of setting the tone. Um, <clears throat> Pardon me here for just a moment. Spring allergies are just working on me today. So hopefully uh, in your online class, you have an orientation module set up. And, and as I mentioned earlier, in that orientation model module, you have um, your syllabi um, linked out as a printable document. Um, Someone else mentioned or questioned the importance of having a, a syllabus quiz. That's also important. Um, but I would challenge you to say, is that enough? And so we're gonna go back to kind of the, the curb appeal idea. Um, can we create curb appeal, appeal in a course? Um, I have an example that I'd like to share with you uh, that was created by Cato Buss. Um, Cato is an associate professor and chair uh, person in the Department of Theater at the University of Central Oklahoma. Um, Cato has more than 20 years of experience as an actor, as a director, as a teacher. And I think with that said, you're going to see his creative and memorable way of catching his students' attention really coming out in this example. Um, and he also shares many of the course um, topics with his um, viewers. <clears throat> so if you will, I'm gonna play this um, video and, and then we'll come back to the presentation. Maybe here. Good evening, and welcome to Development of Drama. I am Kato Bus, a professor of theater at the University of Central Oklahoma. Thank you. 
of drama is a survey of dramatic literature from antiquity to the present. The course examines a comprehensive list of plays in terms of content, style, and theme. Additionally, the course views each play as a touchstone in the history of theatrical performance as well as contemporary stages. What this means is we will read eight plays and discover why they are so special. These plays include... Oedipus! Hamlet! Voidsek! Six characters in search of an author! The good person of Sejuan! Waiting for Godot, Angels in America, and the America play by Susan Laurie Parks, all of which are conveniently held in this one anthology! Thank you for taking my course. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think you can see that not only does his method support the goals of the course, but you really see his personality come out. Students really, um, even though they might not ever meet Cato in person uh, from this course, they really get a feel for what he would be like in a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, so I think he does a, a great job in, in setting the tone for the class. And when you think about it and you compare um, what would students, what would engage students more? Seeing those same um, list of to main topics and resources listed in a bulleted format in the course syllabi, or just having the ability to, uh, to, to really see his technique shine, uh, create a stronger curb appeal for that course. So the next thing I'd like to look at is teaching philosophy and, and ways that we can share our te teaching philosophy. Um, I have a, a professor in the uh, Department of Mass Communication that I think does a great job uh, really using creativity um, and she has done so through a, a website that she created. Um, Moose Tyler uh, um, um, is a lecturer in, in Mass Comm as I was saying um, and you know the, the really cool thing is that one, I just think having the name Moose is, is totally awesome. I mean, she's using her name uh, to create a, a complete culture or even a, a, vulture, a virtual uh, city for the courses that she teaches. Um, and I, I would like to point out that, um, that all of Moose's classes are delivered in a physical classroom. And yet she still finds a, a fun way to extend her classroom boundaries beyond those uh, physical barriers of, of the space that she teaches within. Um, one thing that I've noticed over the years is, um, is really a tendency uh, for faculty to be uh, somewhat reserved about sharing their teaching philosophy in an online class. And I've never uh, really understood that because I think it's, it's part of our natural conversation and usually part of the first few days of class when we walk in and we meet students for the first time and we just naturally share that information about ourselves, but there's something about putting it in writing uh, or in a video that, that intimidates faculty. Um, I would encourage you to find ways, um, find your creative voice and find ways to share that with your students. Um, let them see let them hear why you love to teach. Um, I think Moose does an a, a excellent job in doing this. Um, you can see here that um, she makes her teaching philosophy quite simple uh, and easy to, um, um, to remember and to relate to. Um, I think she also does within her website a, a great job of 
um, setting up ways, additional ways uh, to communicate with her students. Um, once you uh, go to her website called Mooseville USA, uh, it serves as an entry point to each of her courses. And again, as, as Cato, uh, Bus was using his theatrical expertise to grab our attention. Um, Moose uses her branding and marketing, marketing expertise to extend communication and to engage her students. Um, if you dive deeper into her course website, um, students receive um, frequent information updates. Um, she shares resources. Uh, she shares information that supplements um, her classroom learning environment. Um, um, example assignments and, and really uh, just finds ways to, to further the, the teaching and learning experience. Um, you know, this is important, I, I think, in any classroom setting, uh, but it is vital in an online class um, and that we um, find ways to um, support that requirement for regular, to, for regular and substantial interaction with our students. Um, which leads me to our next um, element that we'll talk about, which is instructor and student questions. So in one of my online classes, I, I use a tool called uh, Padlet. Um, and I use that tool to start conversations with students about the course assignments. Um, so Padlet is basically an online virtual bulletin board, if you will. Um, and it, it's a tool in which um, students and professors can uh, collaborate, uh, reflect, share links and pictures and, and do so in a secure location. Um, I, I like that Padlet allows the user to create a hidden wall with a custom URL. So um, once um, a, a class is complete, I usually wipe that uh, or copy it first and then wipe it clean. And, and we start over with a fresh uh, bulletin board. Um, I like that I can set notifications um, and, you know, and share. Um, we, you can print, you can export. It has some really cool features and, and is super easy to use. Um, so normally what, what you would see under each of the main areas, um, basically I, I take um, all of the main graded assignment areas uh, from my class and create a, a pin for those. And uh, the students ask questions and, you know, it varies. Uh, some, sometimes uh, the students are real talkative and, and have a lot of questions and other times uh, they don't use it as much. Uh, but I, I continue to use it because I think it's, it's just one more way to, to get students engaged and, and really not being afraid you know, to ask those questions. So the next course element uh, that I would want to look at is how we provide an overview of the course for the students. And again, you know, if we're in the classroom, we're gonna take time to provide that overview. Um, but sometimes it's, it's a lot um, easier to skip over that essential information in the online classroom, or we provide it simply, you know, as a, a small section in the syllabus or maybe a small section in the course orientation area. Um, so one of the classes that I um, love to teach focuses on uh, personal consumer skills. Um, the interesting thing about this class is the, the ages, the age range in a, a typical um, section will range from 18 to 50 plus. And one of the first assignments that I have students to complete is a reflection paper on their current understanding, understanding of consumerism. Um, and they also address their personal need to know more about at least one or more of the topics um, that will be covered throughout the course. And it's always funny because on numerous occasions, um, the younger students tend to, to really brush off the importance of the retirement topic. Um, they're not there in their lives. They're not ready for that. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, the older students tend to not see the need to talk about or learn about budgeting and nutrition and 
you know, some things that they feel like, you know, throughout their lifetime, they've already been there, done that. Um, so I'll show you a few, uh, uh, three short videos, um, and then we'll come back to this, this thought. Welcome to Problems of Today's Consumer. This course presents the economic aspects of purchasing for the consumer, including consumer credit, protective agencies, principles of consumer choice, consumer services, and the family as a center for consumer education. Now, what does that really mean? Well, it means we're going to cover a wide range of topics that contribute to your experience as a consumer. We'll cover things such as the quality and quantity of resources, We'll talk about the government's role in consumerism. We'll look at your consumer goals versus your lifestyle. We'll look at the effects of advertising. We'll talk about fraud and identity theft. We'll visit financial planning, branding, fast food versus your... Okay, so you get the idea on that one. Um... So, when I first started this course, I had no idea what to expect. I honestly kind of thought it was going to be an economics course like a math course. So, I was pleasantly surprised when I discovered that it was going to be about consumerism in a way I never understood consumerism before. I have loved getting to learn again, be reminded, or even learn for the first time what it means to be a consumer, how important it is to plan ahead, not to just fly by the seat of your pants. I loved the fast food portion. I loved the budgeting part. I loved the insurance and the credit and um, the retirement parts. There were just so many great things to be reminded of again. Okay. So, and I won't take time to play the other student's uh, video on this particular element. Um, but you kind of get the, <clears throat> the idea. Um, having students to, um, to not only see their professor, hear them talk about what the course is going to cover, um, but also um, that peer information, that peer connection um, really goes a long ways. And so, um, you know, taking time to um, have students um, share their experiences, especially when a, a, a a group of students might not have um, that immediate connection with your material. And one of the things that, um, that we find is that when, when students can make a connection and, and create that need to know more, um, they're more engaged. And so uh, that, that's the goal um, with this particular example. Okay, so the next um, element that I would talk about would be um, how we can set, how we can use animation and interaction and to set um, the course into a, a broader context for learning. Uh, Katrina Locker is an associate professor uh, of United States history and environmental history, and she's also the chair of our history and geography department at UCO. And Katrina uses um, a gaming theme, kind of animated video, to provide an overview of her course topics. Um, animation connects with people, and it connects on a deeper emotional level. Um, it evokes um, instant feelings of nostalgia, of humor, of excitement. Um, and if we can use it effectively to convey information, then students stop and pay, pay attention. They engage with the experience. Um, I recently heard that um, a stat that people will remember animations 20 days longer, 21 days longer, I'm sorry, than static images or text. I wish I could remember the, the source of that. I just heard it in passing and it kind of stuck with me. It, it, it does make sense. Um, so I'll play just a quick uh, little clip of this video. Hello. Welcome to History 4513-5513, History of Mexico. I'm Professor Katrina Locker, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about our upcoming semester. Mexico is a fascinating place with a diverse history, culture, and people. Often, our views of Mexico are shaped by very recent news events and often limit it to what happens along the border or in places like Mexico City. Though these are important places, Mexico is much, much more. We will travel back in time to pre-Columbian Mexico, when the Aztecs rose to power. 
we will study the Spanish invasion and analyze how race, class, and gender shaped colonial society in New Spain. As we investigate the wars for independence, we will evaluate the trials of nationhood. With late 19th century modernization comes a host of new changes and challenges. We will spend quite a bit of time examining the Mexican Revolution, an event that is both incredibly simple and mind-numbingly complex. As we get deeper into the 20th century, we will try to figure out if the revolution was a success or not, or perhaps more accurately, who were the winners and who were the losers. The course will end in our own time, a dangerous task for historians. We will investigate contemporary social, economic, and environmental issues in Mexico. A little background about me. I'm in my sixth year at UCO. So one of the things that I really love about um, Katrina's approach to this is that she provides a, um, a, a timeline um, or um, her list of, of course objectives in, in a way that students can relate to. Um, and throughout the remaining portion of her video, um, she really shares um, you know, her personal experience and, and demonstrates how some of her um, experiences um, throughout her lifetime um, provide her with the knowledge and expertise to, um, to be a professor you know, in the History of Mexico uh, course itself. So I think she does a, an excellent job with that. And just another, another opportunity or way that we can set context uh, for our students. Um, so a couple of months ago, uh, I was reading a post in the WCET uh, discussion newsletter that goes out, and I came across a post by Steve Cavello, and I, I thought Steve used um, video in a, in a um, very clear way to provide a conceptual framework for his course, and I invited Steve um, to join us for the presentation, and he's here, and, and if I can navigate the technology here, I will actually turn it over to Steve to share a little bit about himself, um, where he's from, and, and how he uses a course trailer um, you know, to connect with his students. Well, while she's doing that, um, I will introduce myself. Hello, welcome to Concord, New Hampshire, where Yankee fans are spat upon here. You can probably see my Yankee banner there, but I'm from the New York City area. Uh, my prior career, before becoming involved in higher education was I was a video editor doing TV commercials for the advertising industry in New York City. And I did that for 17 years. And then now I have my fourth career working in higher education as the rich media specialist on the instructional design team here at Granite State College. Uh, now you'll have to stop your screen share in order for me to take the screen share. There you go. All right, so I'm going to take mine here, and you should be able to see me. Okay, yeah. so um, I'm not just an instructional designer here. I am also an adjunct online instructor for Granite State College. Now, Granite State is one of the four institutions of the University System of New Hampshire. It's publicly funded in part. It's a land grant. It's not a community college. And we serve the continuing education arm of the University System of New Hampshire, uh, serving adult learners and those who are continuing their education to complete a degree. And incredibly enough, we are approaching, or we have, I believe we have exceeded 90% of our total enrollment credits are fully online. So we only have a little bit of face-to-face -face or non-online uh, course offerings. And it's not us making these decisions to do this. This is our market that is telling us we want online courses and they're not really signing up for face-to-face -face much anymore. So we have had to develop our best practices in online teaching and learning. And I've been able to use my own course as a little bit of a laboratory. <clears throat> so I encountered a little bit of a problem where I was finding that there were students coming into the course, much like some of the other examples that Tracy had, had described here, where students were coming in with a certain set of expectations about what the course was about, what was the actual process of the course itself, what was the character of the learning. And so I sensed that there was about two, sometimes three weeks of complete disorientation by a, a fairly good size chunk of students in the course to the extent that I said, you know what, I need to get, I, I need to get some kind of communication in advance 
of students coming into the course just so that they know what they're getting into because this is a very different course. So for example, unlike say a biology course or something that is much more sort of factually based or follows the cadence of a particular textbook, the subject matter related to trends in digital and social media has no correct answers. So the, the, the aspect of the course that's very different is students inventing a project of their own design and applying each topic as a building block week to week towards their intended design. It's usually like an app idea to fulfill some sort of need or a work of fiction. Now, uh, in order for students to get a feeling for how this course was going to work, I felt that this sort of trailer idea needed to serve that need, but nothing more than that need. And here's where the little distinction takes place. So I'm going to switch over to my PowerPoint here, as much as I'm not a huge fan of PowerPoint. Uh, what we've got here is essentially these essentials. This is what it is, as opposed to what it isn't. All right, it is about orientation. It is not about details. And to give you an example, what I am not doing is going over the syllabus because if you wanna read the syllabus, read the syllabus. But the role of this kind of communication is to give students a, a feeling for the course so that they have a, a sense of what will they can expect. It should be conceptual and not prescriptive. Prescriptive stuff is in a syllabus. It'll tell you when you have to do things and how you need to do it, but we don't need to do that here in order to provide orientation. And the analogy that I like to make here is that it's, it's almost like you're going on a vacation in a different time zone or a different part of the hemisphere and you kind of need to know how to dress appropriately for that journey because this learning journey is probably going to be a lot different than everything else that you've done before. So the tonality of this kind of communication really should be sort of like an arm around the shoulder as opposed to more sort of, you know, a patrimony or whatever you want to call it. Uh, a couple of rules of thumbs about this kind of communication, whether you do it through a video or some interactive thing like uh, I'm about to show you, is only provide the amount of information that's needed to comprehend the broader concepts of the course and the assignments. You don't need to get into like it has to be APA formatted or anything like that. Focus on the narrative of the course and not what you'll be doing as far as tasks in the course. You can find that out later. And focus on what to expect and being prepared as opposed to, you know, how your rubrics will be assessed or something like that. Now, in theory, if this trailer has been successful, students won't be surprised about what they encounter in the course, how it will be done and what will actually happen. And for that matter, how it will even matter. And they'll have a sense in advance of what the course journey will be. And then when they finally get into the course, it will feel familiar. So what I have been doing here is, and this is the preview mode here, I believe Tracy is gonna share the actual preview link this up here. So you may see this and uh, you don't have to scramble to try to write that whole thing down. I believe Tracy will share it with you. Uh, this is created in Articulate Storyline, and this is what we would call a preview mode. So this is not literally what students would see and how they would experience it when they get it. When they get into the course, it would be a SCORM object in the learning management system that they click on, and then it opens up into a new window, and it, it goes through, and it's interactive, and they can navigate through it. Now, the other aspect of this that's really handy with respect to it being a SCORM object is that it can send data to the LMS. So I can actually check in a very easily accessible report who in the course has actually viewed this all the way through to completion. And that's valuable in case I've got a situation where there's a student who's like, I didn't know we had an assignment or something like this because I can check to see if they watch this trailer. Uh, so I'm not actually gonna play this through because you'll have the opportunity to check this out on your own, but I just kind of wanted to walk you through about some of the key essentials in here. Now you're gonna see an embedded video in here and I'm not gonna play that, but this is part of our Kaltura system, which is basically our own private YouTube. You've probably heard of Kaltura among other sort of video um, media streaming systems. But the idea here is that I can put this embed code into this frame and then every term I can just go into Kaltura and replace the video with the new term video and this shows up here as whatever the most recent up 
upload has been. So I don't have to go back in here and republish this, which I thought was a, a key benefit of doing it the way I did it. And what you have here is a narrated slideshow that tells the story about what this course is about and some of the philosophical things here. This is all animated. Again, you can check all this out on your own. But the one thing that I felt that was really important is to describe what it is not about so that there aren't any surprises about someone thinking that this had to do with how to use social media because that's not what it is. Uh, I go through some very key uh, facts about what actually happens in the course. There's an ebook, how things are assessed. There is a supplemental topic, uh, a supplemental assignment here that has to do with selecting a topic that is not covered in the course so that students can select something that goes beyond the scope of the course itself and some information about the final projects. And let's see, I think there's one part in here. Let's see, there's a self check in here that, hold on, there's cats in it. You gotta love the cats. All right, now there's some interactivity in here that gives me an opportunity to put in some examples of projects that students have done in the past and they can look at these at their own pace and they can hit continue and move forward here. So there's a little bit of difference between showing just a straight up orientation video as opposed to something where they have an opportunity to sort of go through it. And as the instructor, if I wanted to put something in here just as sort of a self check, like, okay, are you sure that you understand that you can choose this or that? Uh, that becomes an option and I can actually collect the data on students who have responded to that. Uh, so one of the questions that I asked in my course itself, I have a little five question informal survey about techniques that I've been trying in this. For the last three, I think two, maybe three terms that I've taught this course, I have asked in what ways the course trailer has been beneficial or what effect the course trailer has had. And I've been getting consistently positive responses from students. In fact, some of the things that I put into my ebook, and this is the actual textbook that I use for the course in Pressbooks, I have a pay it forward page from comments from prior students saying what they would say to future students about this course. And one of the things that I intend to put into this part here has to do with the course trailer, like watch the course trailer, it will actually be beneficial to you. Uh, so I believe Tracy has given me about five to seven minutes to quickly go through everything that I offer here in this um, in this strategy here. And I'm going to stop the screen share and open it up if anyone has any questions, either now or later. And uh, that's about all I can present in that short amount of time. <laughs> All right, Steve, thank you for doing that. So let me get back to my screen here. And Kyle, are you seeing any questions at this time? Or do we want to come back at the end? And We don't currently have any open questions. Okay, excellent. Well, Steve, I, I really appreciate you sharing your expertise and taking uh, the time out of your day um, to, to run through that course trailer. Um, you know, I, I think you cover so many things that we've we've talked about so far uh, in the session. Um, you know, and, and just having having the students um, click through and interact and and um, affirm that they're understanding as they go through. Um, you know, really, I, I think puts the onus of of responsibility for learning back on the student. And I, I really like your your example and I appreciate um, that you've shared that with us. Um, the, the next topic would be ways that we can set expectations uh, for students. Um, are you seeing, are you seeing my screen now? Yes. You're looking a little odd on my end. Okay. Um, so just as Steve just mentioned, um, you know, we want to share overviews of the course, overviews of the assignments and expectations, but um, providing the details, the evaluation criterion, um, that, that really um, should be in the course itself, in the syllabus, um, and presented in other formats. So I'll give you just a quick um, video 
that I've done for a recent assignment and once again also asking a former student to come in and share her experience and, and to make that peer connection. Do you know where your money goes each day? That's a good question, right? And have you thought about how much money you spend on fixed expenses each month? Do you know what you spend on food, transportation, and other expenses? How do your monthly expenses compare to your income? And what would happen if you had a financial emergency and you needed a larger than normal sum of money to cover an unexpected expense? These questions might create a sense of panic for you, and you're not alone because two-thirds of people, regardless of age, gender, socioeconomic status, they lack the knowledge of basic personal finance. This assignment will lead you to examine your finances and compare the money you have coming in each month to those normal outgoing expenses. You will also learn to dig deeper into the smaller daily expenses that add up quickly. Let's hear the thoughts from a former student on this assignment. The 14-day expense report was not my favorite thing at first. I was, didn't want to be blatantly aware of all the impulsive purchases that I make. And it really helped me do that because I was spending an insane amount on coffee, which I had no idea. And cutting out small things like that really helped me realize that I could be saving so much and preparing myself for life after college, which I didn't even think about until my senior year. And as that is quickly approaching, I'm now in a better position than I would have been, I think, than if I wouldn't have taken this class. So, you know, with that, um, again, just a, another a brief example. It takes very little of the student's time, uh, but hopefully catches their attention. Um, the final element that I wanted to share today with you as we kind of um, end our time together um, was how we share um, learning resources. And I, I think one of my pet peeves about sharing resources online is how we share them and when we share them with students. Um, I often see them buried in long lists of files and assignments and in the middle of required readings, and there's often very little direction provided. And honestly, I, I really have my doubts if students ever take the time to really look at those resources. Um, I've started using Pinterest to share um, just a, a very limited number of resources for each main topic in my course and I change those resources out frequently uh, and always keep the numbers low. Um, I, I like the visual layout you see in Pinterest. Um, it, it's simple, it's interesting, um, students are familiar with it. Um, and I, and the, sorry about that. The other thing that I do is I, I provide um, this list of resources uh, from Pinterest as a link actually in the course orientation module, um, just below the syllabus. So by doing so, um, I, I'm piquing the interest of the students in the course topics without the immediate pr uh, pressure that they feel to complete the assignments. Um, the other thing that I like about using Pinterest is that there's an addictive factor to it. Um, I mean, think about it, once you start reading about a topic, um, one resource leads to another and you're hooked and you find that you, you know, have spent a lot of time there. Um, who doesn't like seeing students hooked on learning, right? Um, but on a side note, um, we need to make sure that students understand how to evaluate sources and that they don't get too caught up in that. So that, that can be um, one of the challenges and one of the things we want to be aware of. So with that, uh, brings us to the end of the, the 10 elements, um, how, how you present, how you address and share those 10 elements um, can come in a variety of different ways. I've listed here, um, we don't have time to go over each and every one of them, but I've listed some that are free or free-ish, you know, based on, on how you're using it, uh, and also some uh, tools that that um, cost um, as either a per user um, fee or perhaps a site license. Um, as Steve mentioned, he used um, uh, Storyline to create his example. Um, 
one of the examples that, that I use that, that shares the course overview was actually using uh, H5P. Um, I used uh, Padlet and Pinterest. And um, so all of these are great examples. Um, and again, uh, never use the technology to drive what you're doing. Have a need, have a, an objective, and find the technology that fits your need. Um, and whenever possible, uh, you know, we always encourage um, users of, and faculty to, to find those uh, free resources when possible. So, at, you know, as we kind of conclude today, um, we have to take just a few minutes just to, to think through uh, everything that we've talked about today in terms of accessibility. Um, and I would just not do justice to uh, this topic at all without uh, bringing up the importance of accessibility. Um, so from a document perspective, um, make sure that you are um, using headings, that you're linking your text, um, that you set your tables up well, and that your, your doc document structure um, has been checked thoroughly for accessibility. Um, and in terms of the, the tools that I mentioned, the tools that you've seen um, demonstrated throughout today, um, check their accessibility uh, features. Make sure that you can add that alt text, um, that you can change the colors of the text, you apply headings to uh, the content and hyperlinks, so on and so forth. Um, Knowing that students can use their keyboard um, and screen readers to navigate and access your information is just really critical to an effective and uh, comparable um, learning experience uh, for all students. So in summary, um, what you can do as you take away this information is Think about the information from your course syllabus that's most essential. Make sure you have that present and then find ways that you can enhance that information, um, present it in new ways that, that really gain and garner the attention of your learners. Um, explore those tools, find the one that, that best fits your needs. And again, always remember uh, the importance of accessibility. So that wraps up um, the presentation itself. I would um, open it up for questions. Be happy to share the, uh, the slides and at the end of the slides um, are the resources and the content, uh, the uh, contacts for all the individual contributors to uh, the material today. Um, Kyle, do we have any questions from if you don't have any uh, questions open at the moment, we'll, I'll give you, uh, everybody a minute in case uh, anybody wants to type out a question in the Q&A box. Um, and in, in the meantime, uh, I'll just make a brief plug for the uh, rest of the summit. We have two sessions left. Uh, you can join uh, Dr. Bucky Dodd and me tomorrow at 2 p.m. for a presentation on the state of online learning in Oklahoma, some great statistics and facts about what's going on. And then Friday, or Thursday at 10 a.m., uh, Kenny Tapp will present a practical guide to teaching online courses. And it looks like we do have a question, Tracy. Um, any suggestions on creating curb appeal for gen ed math courses? I believe I can safely say most students don't like taking them, but have to take them for gen ed requirements. How do you get students excited about a topic they hate? Mm. Well, gosh, that's a really good question. Um, and I think, you know, I think anytime we can uh, reach a student from their perspective, um, they're, they're automatically more engaged um, in the material. So um, math is a subject where um, it, it, they may have a difficulty seeing how they would apply it in life. Um, but if you can take um, some examples and demonstrate to them how they might um, use a particular math skill to uh, make a calculation that would help them to build something or uh, plan for some, you know, plan for something um, that related to some, you know, I don't know if you have students, um, you know, if you poll your students and know that you have students with specific majors and you can find some application of a mathematical uh, concept and, and apply it to, um, you know, specific 
um, curriculum areas. Um, that always helps students that they can see that it, it does reach beyond the, um, the learning experience itself and, and later in life they're going to use those basic math skills probably uh, far more than they ever anticipated. So great question. Okay, great. Well, that puts us just about at time. Um, I want to say thank you to Tracy for sharing your expertise with us. Um, this was some really great information about getting students engaged with their course um, right at the beginning and, uh, and really selling the course through the syllabus. So uh, we, we very much appreciate you taking the time to do it. It looks like Steve had to drop off, but we appreciate him joining us all the way from uh, New Hampshire as well. So um, thank you for, for taking the time to, to present this to us, Tracy. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us and I hope to see you all in the next uh, couple of days and uh, that you can join us for those final two presentations and uh, have a great afternoon.